Good evening. Welcome. Here we are at uh, Wednesday evening, February the 10th, and we are assembled for our Bible study. I want to thank all of you who've come for the in-person Bible study tonight, for being here in the auditorium. We have people elsewhere in the building in classes. We have some who will be joining us through live streaming and still others who will see the program down the road someplace when they decide to play it. So welcome to all. Hope you have an open Bible. We are studying the book of Colossians. We are in chapter 2 and we'll begin with verses 12 and go through 13 and 14 tonight. Let's uh, open with prayer, shall we? Our Father, we're thankful for the beauty of this day, the warmth that we enjoyed, the sunshine. We pray that we might find a warmth and a beauty here as your people who are studying your word. May we have open and receptive minds. May we look for things that would help us be better than we are. Would you bless those of this congregation and elsewhere who are suffering with uh, illnesses and diseases? Would you comfort and strengthen them? Help us to be of encouragement to one another, but above all, help us to trust you and lean hard on you. Again, we pray that you would be with us in our study tonight. Through the name of Jesus, amen. Last week, if you were here, we dealt with verses 8 through 12. And I'll give you the microwave version of what we studied, the four things that we learned. First of all, Christians always need to be on guard against false teachers and false doctrine. In the book of Colossians, chapter 2, Paul warned the Colossians about things like um, the traditions of men, the philosophies of men. And we need to make sure that we try the spirits to see whether they are of God or not. We cannot afford just to open our minds and receive and accept anything we hear. Number two, we talked about the fact that Christians are only complete in Christ. Now the theme of Colossians is that Christ is complete and that in all things he would have the preeminence. Well, since he's complete, He's able to make us complete. Jesus is really all we need. That's the point of Colossians. Number three, we learn that it is at the point of baptism that we become God's children. And baptism is seen as a spiritual circumcision. We are not God's children prior to baptism. I'm sorry there are people who believe otherwise but the scriptures are very clear on that, that baptism is the point in which we become his children, are added by the Lord to his church, and that God performs through Christ a spiritual circumcision. And then we learned, finally, that in baptism our faith is in the mighty working of God. Baptism is not a work of merit. It's not a means of our earning salvation. But rather, in baptism, God works. And he changes us. He makes us new. The blood of his son washes away our sins. Now, tonight, I want us to look at verses 12 through 14. And you may be saying, well, verse 12, didn't you just talk about it? Not as much as I want to. And I want us to go back and start again at verse 12 and understand some things about baptism. Let me read that verse with us. This is Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12. 
buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. This section is really about freedom. And we're going to find out in verses 12, 13, and 14 that there are two kinds of freedom or freedom from two things that are discussed. First of all, there is at baptism the point in which we become free from sin. Baptism is the dividing line. It's the time and the place where we become free from sin. But also this section talks about the fact that we are free from the law because of Jesus. Now the Judaizers, uh, these were people who tried to get Christians to be bound by the law, and especially the law of circumcision. And Paul makes the point that in Christ we are free from the law. Now, that was a hard thing for the Jews to understand and to grasp. I've made this point many times. Uh, we are, as Americans, uh, one thing, and as religious folks, another thing. Uh, as Americans, that's our nationality. Christians, that's our religion. If you were a Jew, that was your religion, and that was your nationality. And it was just hard to give all of that up. And may I just say, as a sidebar, that I think we need to be very careful that we don't make our nationality our religion. That we don't make our politics our religion. There are people who seem to be far more concerned about the fact that America is facing difficulty than they are concerned about the fact that the world is facing hell. And we get all concerned about one, and rightfully so, but neglect the other, which is a greater concern, I would think, wouldn't you? And so what we find here is that there were Judaizers who were trying to bind the law. And Paul makes the point that we are set free from the law. In verse 12, baptism is referred to as a burial and a resurrection. Now, if I were to ask you, which of those two things do we pay the most attention to, think the most about when we talk about baptism, I would expect that it's the burial part. And we don't always stress the fact that we don't stay buried in the water. If we did, we would drown. We are raised from that baptism to walk in newness of life. You cannot have baptism without both the burial and the resurrection. Now, as we noted last week, these verbs are aorist passive participles. Now, I don't want to confuse you with that, uh, you're not going to have to know that any time in the future, I'm sure. But it does help us understand something about baptism. An aorist verb indicates a single action, usually in the past. How many times are you buried? Well, once. We don't keep being buried and, buried and 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 buried. If it was a present tense participle, you would just have to keep doing that every day and every day and every, every day. How many times are we raised? Well, the once. And so the aorist passive participle indicates that we are buried. It's a one-time action at some point in the past, and we are raised. Now, I know there are people, and we will see an example of that a little later, who are what we call rebaptized. Uh, these are people who are not convinced that the first time they were baptized was uh, what it ought to be. And they want to make sure to have no doubt in their mind. But I believe we could only be baptized 
really for remission of sins one time with full understanding of what we're doing. Now, these actions were the result of what somebody else did. Do you realize that you are passive in baptism? Now, uh, you, you get different clothes on so you won't get your good clothes wet and um, you, you have a towel to dry off and, uh, and you allow somebody else to baptize you. It's not a work that you do. It's not something you can be given credit for doing. It's something that somebody else does for you or to you. And so we allow somebody that we trust to bury us and to raise us. It must have been 50 years ago that uh, a man came forward in one of our services to be baptized. And uh, I had been working with him. He was a man's man and uh, had lived a full life in many ways. He drove a uh, uh, big truck, semi-truck. Nothing wrong with that, but that just shows you the kind of a man. He, he was not a 98-pound weakling. But he was deathly afraid of water. And he told me. He said, I don't know whether I can do this or not. I am so afraid of water. I said, George, we got it. Well, it didn't take me long to learn we didn't have it. He stepped into the water and he stepped back out. I tried to get him down in and he said, I don't think I can do this. And he started back out. And we went on for what seemed like forever. And finally I said, George, do you trust me or not? I've never lost anybody in the baptistry. <laughs> he said, yeah, I guess. I said, just let me do it. It'll be all right. Well, we, we baptized George. But it took a lot of trust in me to do something to him that he could not do for himself. So, it is a burial and a resurrection. But that's not all that verse 12 teaches. In baptism, the Colossians shared in both the burial and resurrection of Jesus. It's a co-burial and a co-resurrection. Did you notice when I read, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God. So while somebody else lowers us into the water and raises us from the water, we are united in that water with Jesus. It is a likeness of his burial and his resurrection. Did you ever wonder why that was? What's so important about that? We say, what can wash away my sins? Song leaders, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Well, I thought it was baptism. Here's the way we say it. Baptism is when the blood of Jesus is what? The blood of Jesus washes away our sins in baptism. When did Jesus shed his blood? In his death. Remember, the soldiers came to break his knees, which would hasten death. When they got there, you remember, he was dead already. So the soldier thrust a spear into his side. I don't think that was a malicious act. I think he probably was just checking to make sure he was dead. I was watching one of my Alaska shows the other day, and they shot a moose, a fellow shot a moose. And I mean, it was a big moose. And you know what he did when he walked up to it? The first thing he did is kind of stood back and took his gun and punched it in the eye. Because if the moose was dead, he wouldn't move. If he had any life in him at all, <laughs> he would have come up out of there. And so I think the spear in the side was to test if Jesus was dead, and he was. The blood and the water came out. His blood was shed in his death. What happens in baptism? 
I am united with Jesus in his death where the blood was shed. So baptism is the where, blood is the what. And Jesus, God through Jesus, performs at that time what Paul refers to as a spiritual circumcision. Remember that the Judaizing teachers were trying to force physical circumcision on the Christians. They were saying, oh, you can be a Christian, but you have to be a Jewish Christian. You can be baptized, but you also have to be circumcised. And Paul was saying, no, there is a circumcision involved, but it's not a circumcision of the flesh. It's a circumcision of your heart that God does through Jesus. It is a work of God. And what results is forgiveness of our sin. Now, here's why this is important, folks. Did you ever talk to someone about baptism and they argued against it saying, we're not saved by works and baptism is a work? Did you ever, did you ever have that happen? I see some people going like this. That's a, that's a common argument. Well, it is a work, but it's a work of God. It's not a work that I do. I allow somebody else to baptize me. But God through Jesus performs a spiritual circumcision and forgives my sins. Notice in verse 12, through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. If God could raise Jesus from the dead, he can raise us from the dead. Not physical death but we die to sin and are raised to be new creatures. Romans 6, here is the passage that goes with this. Uh, I've encouraged you to write in the margin of your Bible, and here's a verse that you need to mark down, Romans 6, 3, and 4. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, let's read verse 13, Colossians 2. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now we're going to find in this section that being buried and raised with Jesus brings about three things. First of all, the spiritual circumcision. Secondly, a new life in Christ. We're raised to walk in newness of life. And thirdly, forgiveness from our sins. Prior to their baptism, the Colossians were dead in sin. But following it, they were made alive. Now, as I indicated a little while ago, uh, Paul is not talking about physical death and life, but he's talking about spiritual death and life. We die to sin. We are raised to be new creatures in Jesus Christ. John 5, 24. Here's another verse that you might want to jot down in the margin of your Bible. Most assuredly... I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. What happens when we become Christians? We pass from death into life. Now, some people are a little confused about this has everlasting life. And so the question is, do we have it now or will we have it uh, after a while in the great by and by? Well, yes. I think there are aspects of the everlasting life. In promise, we have it now, and it is such a sure promise that we can say we have it because we trust God that much. 
Our confidence is in his ability to deliver what he said. I will have it in reality when I die and spend an eternity with God in heaven. And so I have eternal life in real prospect now, in assurance now, but in actuality later. And we pass from death into life. Now, I would ask you just to contemplate something. Just contemplate the idea of being free from all your trespasses. Now, you know what he said? Didn't he say, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now, we're not going to have one of those meetings where we just open it up and let everybody tell all the mean, rotten, no good for nothing things they've ever done in their life. First of all, we don't have that much time. And secondly, I don't want to have to tell you mine. But we've done enough things to be embarrassed about. We've done enough things to break the heart of God. Things that we're ashamed of. Things that we know are sin, that violate His will. Paul said, that's what you used to have. But something has happened. You've been buried and raised again. And all of your trespasses, all of your sins have been removed. You just think about it. The blood of Jesus is so powerful that it forgives all of the sins of those who obey him. Hebrews 5 and 9 reminds us that we need the blood of Jesus to have our sins forgiven. Acts 22.16 is a key baptism verse. Uh, sometimes we tell people they need to be baptized and they say why and we say well you just need to be. It, it would be good to have some verses. Uh, write these in the fly leaf of your Bible or someplace where you can get to them. But Acts 22.16 is one of the key ones. Uh, it has to do with the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Now, did Saul have some stuff in his past that he needed to be forgiven for? Remember he had held the coats of the men who stoned Stephen. Remember that he had persecuted men and women and put them in prison simply because they were Christians. His hands were dripping with blood, folks. They really were. When the preacher got to him, Ananias in this case, he said to him, and now why are you waiting? Now let me just stop and interject this. You know what Paul was doing, or Saul as we knew him then, you know what he was doing? He was praying. You know what a lot of modern preachers would have said? You just keep right on praying, you're about to get through. The only time that anything like this ever happened, the person was not encouraged to keep on praying, but was told to stop it and do something else. Why are you praying? What are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Do you realize that Saul went down into that water with blood-stained hands, but because of the blood of Jesus, he came up out of that water completely clean from his sins. Nothing that he had done in the past could be laid to his charge. And that's a wonderful thought. A do-over. A starting again. But let's not think that that just settles the deal and that's all there is to it. 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. Guess what kind of verbs we have here. Now, if you don't know this one, 
you fail the class because I just harp on this all the time. Present tense. What's a present tense verb in Greek do? Continuous action. Right, Tim. Let me read it that way. But if we keep on walking in the light as he is in the light, we keep on having fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, keeps, keeps on cleansing us from all sins. We have the continual cleansing of the blood when we walk in the light. If that were not the case, you know what would have to happen? We'd have to stay awfully close to the baptistry. And I have a thought that I shouldn't have, so I better run over and be baptized again. I fell to this uh, sin, to this temptation, I better run over and let them baptize me again. We'd look like prunes, folks. We would. Nowhere does it say we have to do that. We have the continual cleansing of the blood as we walk in the light. Now, here's a point. Does walking in the light mean that we never sin? No, it does not. You know how I know that? In verses 8 and 10 of this same chapter, 1 John 1, he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and if we say we have no sin, we make God out to be a liar. Who is he talking to, Christians? Of course we sin. We're human beings. We're weak. Sometimes we sin through ignorance. Sometimes through stubbornness. It doesn't do us any good to deny we have sin. We just get back up and get in the light again. I've fallen down in broad daylight of you. I will tell you that you're more apt to fall in the darkness. It's more dangerous there. I've told you that uh, the steps from my side of the bed into the bathroom, I don't know, two steps, three steps. But when I get up to go to the bathroom in the dark, you know what I'm always afraid of? Falling. Because if I would fall, somebody would have to call the rescue squad, I know. Uh, I think that would be a bad thing. You, you fall in the dark when you can't see clearly. Uh, somebody says, well, put a bright light in there. Well, that keep me awake. So uh, it's kind of a catch-22 thing, isn't it? But here's the point. When we are buried with Christ in baptism, the past is taken care of by the blood of Jesus. When we walk in the light, the present is taken care of by the blood of Jesus. Uh, kind of makes you want to shout hallelujah, doesn't it? That's a wonderful thought that we have forgiveness through the blood of Jesus. Now, verses 14 and 15 of chapter 2. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was uh, contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. Now, Paul uses some words here that help us understand what happened to the law. I want you to notice that he said it was wiped out, wiped away. He said it was taken away. He says it was nailed to the cross. Is that pretty clear language? Can we understand those figures? Can we understand wiped out, taken away, and nailed to the cross? Do you realize, friends, that the law was never intended to be permanent? Now, I know that's a surprise to some people, but the law of Moses was never intended to be a permanent law. Galatians 3 deals with this. Paul, writing to the Galatians, deals with this very matter. He says, what purpose then does the law serve? He just argued that it's been taken out of the way and he knows somebody's going to come up and say, well, what's it good for then? It was added because of transgression. Let me stop right there. How do you know a thing's wrong? Now you might intuitively know some things, but in most of the cases, why do you know that a thing is wrong? Because there's a law that says it's wrong. 
The Old Testament, the law, was added because of transgressions. Till, an adverb of time, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Who's the seed that was to come to whom the promise was made? Jesus Christ. Why was the law given? Because of transgression. How long was it supposed to last until Jesus came? Now that doesn't mean till the day he was born. But till he came and did his work. That's how long the law was to last. Till the seed would come. Galatians 3, 24 and 25 is a parallel passage. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith, but after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Uh, the old King James uses the word schoolmaster. Uh, what do kids look forward to at the end of uh, a year of schooling? Uh, graduation, going on to the next school school year. What do we hope has happened in the school year currently? We hope that it has gotten us ready for the next one. What was the purpose of the law as a tutor? To get us ready for the coming of Jesus. Without the law, can you imagine this scene? Jesus is preaching and somebody comes up and says, um, you say you're the Savior. What do we need to be saved from? Sin. Well, what's sin? Well, it's a transgression of the law. Well, what law? The one that was given so we would know what transgressions are. Do you understand, if we had not had the law, people would not ever have been ready for the coming of Jesus. They wouldn't have understood a thing about him and what he was doing here on planet Earth. And so the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. But after faith has come, and this is not my individual faith, folks. This is the faith, the system of faith, Christianity. Once that's come, we're no longer under that tutor. I have good news for you. You don't have to go back and repeat kindergarten, guys. Have some students over here that are saying hallelujah for that. Now put those together. We are under the law till the seed should come. We are under the tutor until the faith has come. Parallel passages talking about the same thing. Now, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements is an interesting phrase. It literally means a certificate of debt. Now can you picture this? Somebody hands you a sheet that has all of your debts on it. Now some of you wouldn't have to have a very big de uh, sheet and some of us would have to have a pretty big she sheet to contain all the debts we have. And then somebody who had the ability just put an X to it and said, I marked it out. I wiped it out. You don't owe that anymore. I want you to know that's exactly what Jesus did with the law and with our sin debt. Now. There are various views about that. I'll be honest with you. You can get a commentary that will give you some other view. But I always believe we have to look at a thing in its context. And contextually and logically, what Paul is talking about is the law of Moses. And he says it was X'd out. That that handwriting of ordinances was taken out of the way and nailed to the cross. Ephesians 2.15, here's another verse for you. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. What's Paul say? He says that law divided us, the Jew from the Greeks, Jews from the Gentiles and that it was taken out of the way to allow peace to reign.
peace with God and peace with one another. And it was a law of commandments contained in ordinances. And you couldn't have it in place and have peace between Jews and Gentiles. The law had to be taken out of the way before that could occur. The law was canceled because it was against us. It was contrary to us. It was hostile to us. Would you like to have lived under the law of Moses? I don't think so. It required obedience without a mistake. You know, the only way that you can be justified by a law system is to keep it perfectly. Because the very time you mess up even that much, you've broken the law and you can't be justified by it. The only way to be justified by a law system is not to sin, not to break the law, ever, in any way. And by the way, many of the cases in regard to sin and the law demanded death. You remember that woman was brought to Jesus in John 8, taken in the very act of adultery? What did the law say? Stone her. By the way, what did it say about the man? Stone him too. But they had conveniently missed him in the raid. What did Jesus say? He forgave her because he was the Savior. He had the ability to do so. And he knew that the greater sin there that day was that which was committed by the Jewish leaders. It was seen as a curse and a yoke, a heavy yoke to be born. I would not want to live under the law. And Jesus nailed to his cross because of its nature and because its purpose had been fulfilled. Romans 6.14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. I'm glad for that verse. I'm glad that the system under which we live is a grace system. Now, that doesn't mean there's no law in a grace system. It doesn't mean there's no grace in a law system. That just means at its heart, one is about law keeping, and at its heart, the other is about the mercy and grace of God. And we do not live under the law. We live under grace. Hebrews 10, 9. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. Uh, if you have a testament, the last will and testament, before you can make a new one, the old one has to be rendered not applicable. You can't have two wills in, a, uh, in accord at the same time, in force. You can't do that. Generally speaking, it's the last one. Now, there may be some nuances there, but generally speaking, it's the last one. Before he could give us a new testament, he had to take the old testament away. Before he could give us a new covenant, he had to take the old covenant away. And he came to do that. And I really am glad, by the way, as New Testament Christians, we're not under the law. The early church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, not in the law of Moses. In giving the Great Commission, Jesus told the disciples to teach all things whatever I've commanded you, not whatever Moses has commanded you. Clearly, we are under the law of Jesus that at its heart involves grace and mercy, and we are to teach all things that Jesus commanded. Now, early Christians struggled with some of that, as I indicated before, but it was clear that they could not be justified by the law. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Here's the application. Give it to you quickly. We're about out of time. Number one, baptism is not a work of merit. It's a work of God. When I'm baptized, I trust the working of God. Number two, in baptism we die to sin and are raised to a new life in Jesus Christ.
Number three, at baptism we are forgiven of all our trespasses and a continued walking in the light keeps us clean because of the blood of Jesus. The law of Moses, number four, was taken out of the way when Christ died on the cross. Well, I hope it's been helpful to you. I know that uh, I've been told, I, I was just itching to ask a question. Well, the very nature of what we're doing here with the live streaming doesn't permit that. Plus, as I've confessed, I have a hard enough time hearing, and I expect about half of the class, if you ask questions, would me be going, huh, and somebody from the audience trying to yell loud enough for me to hear. And so because of that, we just decided it would be a lecture. That's not the best way to teach. Places a great deal on the shoulders of the teacher. Most of us are not good enough to pull that off. But uh, I believe that uh, that's best under the circumstances. And I hope that uh, it's been helpful to you. Read a few verses ahead. I think we may cover more than four verses next time. At least we're going to try to do that. Thank you very much for coming tonight. I'm going to dismiss you in just a moment. We'll have some uh, people come, some men come, and prepare the stage area here by removing the pulpit stand. And uh, uh, we are rejoicing that uh, Chris Wentworth is going to be baptized tonight. Uh, she was at some point in the past, but she's just not real sad.